So I thought I'd like to move on now to a discussion of Beowulf. Uh, I've been reading Beowulf. What I'd like to do is a sort of series of uh, works of Western literature uh, <clears throat> and go through them chronologically, beginning with the earliest. And by Western literature here, I'm, I'm defining a boundary um, that does not include the classical civilization of the Greeks and Romans. Um, I want to pick up with the disintegration of uh, that civilization in 410, uh, when the Western Roman Empire falls prey to the barbarian invasions, and right about 410. And it's at that time that the shift to the northwest is already being signaled by, in about 450 AD or so, the Angles and the Saxons are invited to come over to uh, Britain by the Britons, who are Celts, and they invite the Angles and the Saxons over in about 450 AD, led by Hengist and Horsa. Uh, and of course, they don't leave. They're invited over by the Brightons in order to fight the Picts and the Scots in the far north. The north remains Pictish, and it's a Celtic culture zone there. Uh, but more or less, that, that, that event signifies uh, the beginnings of the uh, foundations of the northwestern uh, civilization cycle. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any good word for this. Spangler calls it, in the decline of the West, the Faustian civilization, uh, meaning by that the civilization with its love for in all things infinite, infinite space, the infinite expanses of our Gothic cathedrals. Uh, it is a civilization, though, that is still in being and in form, although it's petrifying and it's moving into its uh, tail end here. We're, we're in the dying phases, the cosmopolitan phase that every great civilization enters into. Uh, ours is the most urbane and cosmopolitan now in its planetary and scale. Uh, <clears throat> but we're definitely at the tail end of it. I want to go back to the birth of it. Uh, and the reason I've chosen Beowulf here as a, as a starting text is because this text is really rich. Uh, it's immersed in the culture of the time in very rich ways, and I think we can see a lot of cultures. We can see the sort of birth of the English language here. Uh, the earliest uh, poems in Old English start coming in with Cadman's hymn, uh, long about 600 A.D. or so, right about in there, maybe 500, 500, 600. The first poems start to appear with Cadman, the Genesis A text. Uh, which is a version written by an anonymous uh, Old English uh, monk, probably, uh, of the re that retells the book of Genesis, only it begins with the war in heaven with Satan and his rebellion uh, against God. And um, it almost reads like a rough draft sketch for Milton's Paradise Lost. And I think that uh, certain commentators have mentioned that the Beowulf poet probably knew this text, and I, I think he probably did. I think there's a certain uh, illusion drawn between Grendel's attack on Herat and the uh, Satan's rebellion against God and his attack on God's creation, the earth, uh, when God creates it as a place of refuge for Ad, uh, Adam and Eve. Um, I think there is a direct illusion. Um, so Beowulf is really the first great work of literature to come out of this civilization. There are three dates to keep in mind with reference to it. The first is the time in which the events of the poem are set, which is basically 500 uh, right around somewhere between 490 and 530 AD. That's the setting. And it's historical because a number of the kings referred to in the text have been uh, verified as having lived during that time period, not Beowulf himself. Beowulf, unlike these other characters, is a purely fictional character. He's a mythological dragon-slaying uh, warrior hero, the type represented by Thor in Scandinavian myth. And indeed, he's actually absorbed some of uh, Thor's deeds. Uh, the slaying of the Midgard serpent is directly compared, I think, and miniaturized by this brilliant poet, whose name we do not know. Um, it was analogized to Beowulf's slaying of the dragon at the end of the text. Um, so we don't know the name of this poet. We know that he was a Christian. Uh, England had been recently Christianized somewhere right about the year 600, uh, right in there between 597 and 650, right in that period. So it's only recently been thoroughly Christianized. And this individual, whoever he was, knew Scandinavian myth very well. He was a very brilliant and gifted individual. And he lives at about 700 AD. Um, so the events are set in 500 AD. But everyone's pretty well agreed that the poem was constructed and elaborated out of oral traditions, perhaps. Um, it's not likely that this man is the complete originator of the poem, although he may have been. My suspicion is that he has inherited stories the way the creator of the Gilgamesh epic inherited uh, Sumerian Gilgamesh tales 
and then constructed them anew, this unnamed Babylonian uh, literary genius. Something uh, is similar, I think, in the case of the Beowulf poet. Uh, that's all we know him as. He was uh, the West's, the Northwest's first great literary genius, I think, as we'll see. I want to read through the poem line by line here and give it a kind of textual analysis as we go. Um, <clears throat> And then the other date to consider, the third date to consider, is the time of the writing down of the manuscript. The oldest manuscript dates from about the year 1000 AD, and it was written down by two scribes. We can tell by the two different handwritings. One scribe wrote about a third of it down, and the other scribe continued it. And it's part of a collection of, it's found as a manuscript uh, that's part of a collection of uh, other Old English manuscripts. There are quite a few Old English poems that have survived. Uh, lyric poems as well as a few epics, such as uh, the Elena, uh, which may have been written by, Ky by a man named Kynewulf, possibly. Uh, there are Christian epics such as the Andreas, uh, which used to be thought to be written by Kynewulf, but probably is not now, which clearly uh, the person who has written the Andreas, which dates from somewhere around the year 700, some between 700 and 800, probably more likely 800, has definitely read Beowulf. So um, somewhat on the analogy to the way in which astrophysicists can detect planets orbiting stars, though they can't see them, they can detect the gravitational wobble of the stars and infer them. We have enough evidence to infer, uh, though we can't see him, we know that this individual lived somewhere around 700 AD. We can see the influence of Beowulf on subsequent texts, Old English texts, which date from around 800 to 900. Uh, and Andre the Andreas is one of them that tells the life of uh, St. Andrew. And the Elena is uh, very possibly another one. Uh, so we have a dense, rich collection of Old English uh, texts in Old English uh, that are written and that date from this period, which is contemporary on the continent with Old Norse, the Scandinavian world. Uh, that this poet has inherited. So this poet has picked up from the Scandinavian world uh, its mythology. He was very conversant with it, although he was a Christian, very possibly a monk or a priest, uh, and knows Christianity very well, and knows the Scandinavian uh, mythology very well, though he never refers, except in one instance when he refers to Wieland, uh, the smith god. He doesn't refer to any of the others by name. Although I think that Beowulf is deliberately meant to parallel Thor. I think he's meant to be a sort of anglicized miniaturization of Thor. Uh, and the life of his deeds um, occupies a period that I think is meant in, in an interesting kind of way to echo the Scandinavian arc of the creation of the universe, uh, the erection of a world of light um, that is caught in between the tension of ice in the north and fire in the south. Muspel in the south is the realm of fire. And there's the uh, Janunga Gap in between them, in which Midgard, or Middle Earth, from which, of course, Tolkien has taken uh, the name for his uh, cosmology, Mid Middle Earth. Uh, Midgard has originated as a sort of, uh, the Earth as a kind of flat disk surrounded by water uh, with what's called the Midgard fortification around it, which is a giant wall that has been built by the gods to keep the giants out. The giants live along the shores of this ocean, and they are surrounded then by the Midgard serpent, which is the world encircling serpent that is the northern equivalent of the Greek Okeanos, uh, the world encircling serpent, the serpent that has uh, its tail in its mouth and binds uh, the entirety of the world. Uh, so the fortification that was built by the gods, by Woden in particular, I prefer the Votan, the, the pronunciation is Votan, uh, has built this as a fortification to keep the gods out. And I think there's an implication uh, on the part of the Beowulf poet that Grendel, who is described as basically a 12 foot tall giant, is one of the giants that would have, in Scandinavian myth, would have been thought to have gotten in over the world wall. And uh, so an, an immune systemic type hero, and Beowulf is a type of hero that I would describe as immunological. Um, the Danes uh, have do not have a proper and effective immune system to defend themselves against this giant who has come in over the Midgard fortification, as it were, not literally, but as it were. And Beowulf is brought in as a kind of giant slaying equivalent of Thor. Thor's task was to kill giants, and he always had his hammer, Mjolnir, that he used to hurl at the giants and smash their skulls in. He was the primary immunological hero of the uh, Scandinavians. Um, <clears throat> and so there has been a failure, you'll note, uh, George, uh, George Dumézil was the scholar of mythology who identified uh, the structure, the tripartite structure, 
of Indo-Aryan society as being uh, broken down into three parts, the sovereign or ruling class, the warrior class that enforces the sovereign class, and then the agricultural class that's associated with the soil, tilling of the soil farmers and so forth, uh, and fecundity. And um, the gods, Votan corresponds to the sovereign class um, along with his counterpart, Tu, or Tyr, after whom Tuesday is named, Wednesday is named after Votan. Um, they are the sort of uh, sovereign ruling equivalents. Thor corresponds to the warrior class, and Friar is the god that's associated with the soil to whom the boar is sacred, which may be an important motif as Beowulf's warriors come across uh, the water from the southern tip of Sweden, to, uh, which is known as Jaeltland. Uh, it's tempting to pronounce the Geats, the, their name as Geats, uh, but I've learned that this is not the correct pronunciation. The Geats are the Jaeots. Um, and they have come across from the southern tip of Sweden to Denmark, specifically to Zealand. Uh, the island of Zealand, which is where scholars suspect that Herat, uh, the great fortification built by the Danish king Hrothgar, and which is attacked by Grendel, was built on the island of Zealand, specifically at a place called Lyri. Uh, which was a holy spot, as Tolkien points out in his excellent uh, book on Beowulf that just came out a couple of years ago that his son put out, which is composed of a series of lectures uh, from the 1930s that uh, Tolkien did on Beowulf. And nobody knew this stuff better than Tolkien. I think he's, he's really the best. And his book on Beowulf should be absolutely consulted in addition to the classic line-by-line uh, -line analysis done by Kleber, um, which Tolkien presupposes. Um, and so that's, um, <clears throat> that's the, the, the basic setup and layout of this. So that's what I, I want to proceed to get into here. Now, um, some of the backstory should be known. There's a kind of historical backstory that has a lot of uh, historical validity to it. Uh, some of it's mythical, some of it's historical, but it should be known. We have two separate houses here. We have the houses of the Yeats, uh, who, as I say, occupy the southern tip of Sweden, who are enemies of the Swedes in the north there. They are enemies. And across the water, we have the Danes. The Danes have already, by this time, uh, in which the poem is set, about 500 AD, have recently absorbed the Jutes. Uh, the Jutes had occupied the, uh, the peninsula of Jutland, and they have been absorbed and conquered by the Danes. So the Danes have had a series of successful wars and conquests uh, against the Jutes, but also against the Hethabards. Um, but both of these two houses, the Danes and the Yeats, um, are both have the a sort of shadow of doom about them uh, in both cases. Um, the situation with the Yeats is that the Yeats are at war with the Swedes, but the Danes are allied with the Swedes uh, by marriage. Uh, Rothgar's sister, whose name might be Irsa, we're not sure. The names of all the women are kind of sketchy in this. A lot of their names are either not known or Irsa's name is just a guess. She's married to Onella, the current king of Sweden. Uh, and so the Swedes are in an alliance note with the Danes by way of this marriage, which puts the Yeats in a very difficult position because they are constitutional enemies of the Swedes who will in the eighth century, just a few decades after the construction or the writing of Beowulf, if, if it was written down, it may not have been at that time, but it was composed at that time, uh, were absorbed. The Swedes absorbed the Yeats um, at the end of this by the end of the eighth century here. So in a way, this poem is is uh, a perhaps unintended uh, elegy for the vanishing and absorption of the Yeats way of life, who ceased to have an independent way of life. Uh, Beowulf is their last king in a certain sense, um, and after his death um, and the foolish deed that he undertakes, slaying the dragon, leaves them prey to the Swedes. Uh, who we know will come down and absorb them. And um, so we'll pause there for this video and move on to the next one.